Okay, so without further ado, welcome everyone to the first uh, ever virtual EFF Austin meetup. Um, we've been doing these in the flesh for many years, but uh, you know, as befits a Digital Civil Liberties Award, we are finally fully moving into uh, cyberspace with this here. So um, thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, so uh, for those I see in the chat names, I see old and new people. So um, for those of you who are new, um, greetings. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current uh, president of the board here at EFF Austin. Um, EFF Austin is an Austin-based digital civil liberties organization. We are closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of uh, San Francisco and are the oldest extant member of their EFA or Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is a group of uh, diverse uh, civil liberties organizations based all around the country and a few even internationally. Um, like our uh, big uh, brother sister organization EFF, we tend to focus on trying to preserve rights in emerging technological spaces with issues like um, net neutrality, end to end encryption, uh, end of warrantless surveillance in online spaces, protection of Section 230 of the CDA, fighting uh, bills that are trying to undermine encryption like the Earn Act, uh, et cetera. So we have our fingers in a lot of pies. We tend to be a little less involved in the litigation side and more the educational side uh, compared to EFF due to our limited resources. And one of the primary ways we serve the public is with these monthly uh, meetups that we usually have on the second Tuesday of every month at uh, 7 p.m. Normally at uh, Capital Factory uh, in downtown Austin. But obviously, uh, things are a little unusual right now. So we are trying out our first virtual meetup here. Um, I'm sure there will be a few hiccups in process as I figure this all out. Uh, we're all going to learn together. Um, as I told people who got here a little early, um, just because normally at EF at Austin, we're big fans of not having meetings be just dry presentations. We're very much about collaborative discussion and conversation although we vary it up depending on what a speaker wants to do. That being said, I'm going to encourage that we, at least for this first time, try to keep things somewhat structured, uh, just so that I don't have a uh, massive technical explosion in my face. So general etiquette I'm going to say is for the most part, the beginning here is going to consist of our speaker, Dan Reeser, speaking, who I'm going to introduce here in a moment. Uh, while Dan is giving his presentation, um, I would encourage you all to follow the general etiquette in these situations of keeping your microphone muted, just so we don't have too much distraction and feedback in that. I'm going to ask you to let Dan, for the most part, go ahead and finish his presentation. Um, I. I'm still sort of figuring out exactly how chat works with this combined space because you're all just guests in the space. So I'm not fully sure how much everybody can or can't see group chat. It's something I'm going to have to figure out here. Um, if one of you figures it out and is able during mid talk to ask Dan a chat question, I think that'd be fine and then he can respond to them. But I'm going to ask you to refrain from a uh, verbal questioning until Dan is done with his presentation, at which point uh, we'll have a time for questions. I believe most of you should have permissions to unmute your mics, but if not, I can do a general unmute and we'll just try to have everybody ask questions in a civilized orderly manner. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give a uh, quick shout out to a little bio intro to our speaker here. Um, watch, before I do that, we usually do like to do community announcements um, where people share relevant things in the digital civil liberties community that might be of interest to our uh, speakers going on around town. Um, so I would like to give people the opportunity to share potentially uh, news or events that are relevant and interesting to the digital civil liberties community. Shame of self-promotion is always allowed. Um, you know, obviously, they're probably mostly going to be like virtual webinars going on these days. But if there are ones you think may be of interest to people, now's the time to share them, basically. So does anybody have any news or events they would like to share? Uh, now is the exception to mine. You can unmute yourself and talk if you do. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, hello? Um, uh, hello, who's that? This is Alex Wyckoff. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to share something. Uh, sh sure thing, go right ahead. Okay, cool. So um, one thing that I just uh, got the website up for and launched last week um, is distributed.camp. And that is a virtual conference that's going to occur at the end of May. And it's going to include uh, technologies like IPFS, DAT with a beaker browser, um, I2P, and WebTorrent. So um, that is, I think, um, fairly relevant to the space. And uh, hopefully, uh, you all will check it out. If, and if you find the time and interest, uh, please register. I mean, that, that sounds great. Um, I don't know when you're in. Do you at all have access to the chat option or no? I'm looking for it. Uh, yeah, because I wasn't sure. And there was supposed to be somebody from Cat Factory in the meeting tonight to help me with technical problems, but they don't seem to be here. So mm -hmm. it may be that only I in the space can do that. I'm trying to think of the best way. Um, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to quickly give you my email and then you can email me and I can update the event announcements or actually if you have the event announcements like on meetup or Facebook you feel free to share the link there and then I can disseminate it to the other ones oh awesome thank you so much no problem and yeah as I said we're the number one thing I will get answered from Capital Factory here is figuring out if we have more robust chat with guests or not we'll get that figured out um, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, anybody else have any announcements? Okay. Well, um, and I guess oh, I'll, I'll share our quick announcements, which is we're going to keep doing these virtual meetups for the time being. Um, I'm sure at some point we'll eventually go back to face-to-face -face ones, but I, if I'm being honest, I think nobody can say when that will be at this point. So we're going to assume this is the format for the time being. And I realize that probably for some people, they actually prefer this format because it's a drag to get downtown and park downtown. So, and so certainly from an accessibility standpoint, there's a lot to like about this. And we're gonna have this uh, WebEx space even once all of this is over. Capital Factory is just gonna make this a service they provide for meetups going forward. I will probably eventually look into a way to somehow run this in conjunction with the physical meetups as well. So hopefully we'll get best of both worlds going forward. Um, next month's meetup is going to be with um, our friend Daniel Rossler, um, who's basically going to be talking about something very relevant uh, going on right now, which is, you know, a voting technology with the newfangled voting machines and specifically uh, trying to find out exactly how they work and uh, if your vote actually got recorded the way you thought it did. So, you know, might be a little timely topic. So if you want to tune in in May, that should be our talk. I'm also tentatively in talks with having our friend futurist Ann Boyson talk in June. So that's our short-term programming coming up. Um, I'm sure we may have spin up some other things as we have the bandwidth and figure out various other virtual things we can do. Um, but that's what we got coming up in the short term. So without further ado, I'm going to give a quick introduction to our speaker. So our speaker this month is Dan Reeser. Dan is the Community and Growth Manager for Polkadot, a next generation blockchain network founded by the, co uh, by the former co-founder and CTO of Ethereum, Gavin Wood. For uh, probably most people in this room know Ethereum is probably the most prominent uh, cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. Um, Polkadot, uh, just one sec, gotta let somebody into the room, one sec, all right. Um, so to continue, um, Polkadot will begin its phase launch process in second quarter 2020. I don't know if that time it was still accurate, I'm sure Dan can tell you more, um, but that was the original plan, aiming to solve many of the current issues hindering blockchains from adoption at a global scale, including connection between blockchains, scalability, and rapid upgradability. Dan graduated with a bachelor and master's degree from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business and Information Systems and International Business. He's had a marketing and operations focused career with four years at Eli Lilly and Company, working in pharmaceutical brand marketing and oncology, immunology. And Sorry? Sorry? Somebody say something. Ahorita recién pude entrar porque ese link no sirve que lo habían puesto, tuve que investigarlo. 
Um, I sorry, I do not speak Spanish. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, if somebody did somebody in the room may, I don't know, but we don't have a Unfortunately, we don't have alternative language service, but no, no, I'm sorry. I I, I, I thought that I, I had difficulties right now with the, the microphone, but I have it. Sorry, I can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, okay, sorry. okay, thank you. So I'm gonna much. mute, yeah, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, sorry, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, sorry, so as I was saying, um um, so Dan transitioned his career to blockchain out of the curiosity for the technology's potential, which led him to Austin for his first job with another blockchain project called OneChain. He led marketing and business development globally for this organization before opting to join Polkadot's historic launch under the Web 3.0 Foundation based in uh, Switzerland. He lives in Austin as an avid traveler and as a competitive tennis player. So Dan is going to be talking with us about Web 3.0. For those of us who've been around on the internet long enough, we remember back in the mid 2000s, there was a big deal made about Web 2.0, where the whole idea was that websites would no longer be static HTML pages with creator generated content. Instead, they would be based around dynamic APIs that allowed for user generated content. Everybody was very excited about the possibilities this represented at the time, but as the last 15 years of web history has shown us uh, opening up all these APIs uh, and allowing for user generated content and graph scraping and, sh and sharing and transformation of these data sets has led to many of the current problems both the web and the world is facing. Um, so you may be like, well, what is web 3.0? What is the next phase or step for the web? And, um, you know, I could tell you what little I know all about it, but that's why we have Dan here to tell you more about it. So uh, without further ado, Dan, I'd say um, feel free to go ahead and get started and uh, present your presentation and hopefully you'll be able to do it relatively uh, technical difficulty free. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, let me try to get my screen shared. All right, I can see your screen share, so hooray. <laughs> and let me turn my camera off here so that won't be so distracting. There we go. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah, I, I, I can see it just fine. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty readable to me. I think it's the right size. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, thanks, Kevin, for having me. Um, I got to know Kevin, what was it, about a month, maybe two or three months ago, um, when I was talking to the Austin Blockchain Collective here in Austin about a similar topic and got introduced to Kevin through um, someone named Bill, who was kind of a mutual connection between us. And Kevin was nice enough to give a presentation on net neutrality to kind of the, the polka dot community that we have. And we saw this really interesting overlap between the EFF Austin community and the Polkadot community and the blockchain community in general. Um, so I'm really happy to be here presenting to you guys. Um, thanks for the introduction, Kevin. So um, that's pretty much my background. I'm hoping that um, today you can leave with an understand, a better understanding of what blockchain technology is itself. I know there's a lot of conversation around um, blockchain, around Web 3.0. So I'm, I'm here to kind of explain um, what Web 3.0 is as a whole, what blockchain is at its core, and then not get too deep into what Polkadot is, but I want to at least brief you on the problem that Polkadot is solving um, and give you a little context as far as how Polkadot fits into the history and I think near future of, of where blockchain is headed. And then at the end, I know there's the chat wasn't working for me either, Kevin, so at the end, I think we can just have people come onto the microphones and um, ask whatever questions they have. Yeah, that, that sounds fine with me. I was originally concerned that only I had permission to unmute people, which I thought might be total anarchy, but people seem to have the ability to unmute themselves. So I'm gonna say, yeah, we're gonna try to just 
everybody take their turns and if you see five people unmuted at the same time choose one person to talk you know we, we know how this works we're adults so we'll figure it out so i'm going to dive into uh web 1.0 first just to set some context as far as where where we're headed uh, where we are now and where we're headed with web 3.0 so obviously the internet started back in the 60s and 70s, but around 1990 is when we started to see, kind of like Kevin just, just touched on, a read-only internet where certain technologies came about, like you see at the bottom, like TCIP, SMTP for email, internet browsers. But this was a kind of a basic internet that was read-only, meaning that most people, like consumers, parents, grandparents type of technological capability were only able to consume what was on the internet and not necessarily write information in um, to the internet as it stood. I included these technologies here at the bottom for a specific purpose. I'll revisit these um, towards the end and make a comparison to kind of what we're building in Web 3.0 right now um, and how that's similar to what this technology at this phase of the internet allowed. Um, at this point, you had a lot of networks that were operating in silos, like the early internet networks in the United States. Um, eventually, these networks were connected through these technologies and then obviously eventually grew into this global internet that we have today. So these low-level protocol type technologies are, are one to remember towards the end of the presentation. Then as we moved into the early 2000s through today, um, we had a ton of innovation. We had um, what those technologies, what those low level protocol level technologies allowed was a, you know, a growth of the application layer. So we had, um, we had applications and networks like Facebook and YouTube and Instagram um, all pop up and create this connected network that we have. It allowed for massive explosion in global e-commerce. It connected individuals and created relationships across the world. And um, for a lot of people, improved the quality of life um, that they were experiencing and are experiencing today. At the same time, the internet started with such grand purpose, um, but quickly kind of shifted to this um, to this model that's so profit-driven and, and really created these monopolistic um, you know, organizations that are so focused on kind of squeezing the money out of the data that they're collecting on you and I. So this has brought us to, um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here about privacy, but this brought us to kind of where we are today. With the time after time, um, data breaches or privacy concerns, um, and I'll bring up a, a few more examples of that in a second, just to highlight um, the need for organizations like EFF and for technologies um, like Web 3.0 companies are building right now to shift the power back um, away from these monopolies into and back to kind of the individuals. Um, another important piece to bring up, um, as Kevin mentioned, the election coming up this year, um, I've actually been keeping a note in my iPhone of every time I'm, I see an ad. So if it's on Instagram, if it's on TV, but just trying to make myself aware um, of, of the technology that of the advertising that I'm seeing through the technologies that I that I consume um, But it's just something to keep in mind when you think back at 2016 and what happened with Cambridge Analytica um, And it's just something to be aware of I think for all of us heading into this election year And then last um, the internet started like I mentioned before all this amazing e-commerce capability, but um, what we've seen recently is that the new model or the, the current model of the internet has shifted to turn us as the consumers into the product. So when you see, like when I saw um, Spotify, for example, offering me a free Google Home, why are they offering me a free Google Home, which retails for, I think, around $100? Because my data, my Spotify data for them to associate with my Google record is way more valuable than the $100 piece of hardware that they want to you know, put into my home. So this original tech boom that everyone was so excited about in the early 2000s, late 90s, has really shifted to become an advertising and marketing boom. And hopefully new technologies and regulations will help us get 
um, away from this new model. So a lot of people are asking where our privacy has gone, and I know everyone here is aware of um, Edward Snowden and kind of the courage and bravery that he had in 2013 to come out um, with, you know, based on his experience at the NSA. Um, another great example, the New York Times Privacy Project. If you're not aware of, of that um, journalistic work that the New York Times is doing, uh, they're doing an excellent job in the privacy space, so it's definitely worth following them um, and reading some of the articles that they've come out with. But this is just one example of, of real world data that they got on uh, cell phones within New York City. And it's just incredible to see, you know, how they were able to track certain, um, you know, famous individuals, certain congressional members and so on um, throughout DC and New York through data that they were able to collect through, um, you know, cell phone companies. Cambridge Analytica just Again, I mentioned them earlier, but just to highlight the, the breadth, the global breadth of influence that they had um, prior to really being exposed after the 2016 election. Um, this is a real slide from a pitch deck that Cambridge Analytica gave, and they they literally call it persuasion digital marketing. Um, so, you people may or may not agree, but I would venture to guess that although Cambridge Analytica may not be the one doing it, I'm fairly positive that money has just shifted somewhere else. Um, this is such a powerful tool that politicians have at their hands now. So um, I think we'd all be crazy to think that this isn't going on somewhere in the world um, just without people knowing at this point. And then this, uh, this is actually something that came up around, what was it, four, five, six days ago? I actually don't remember the date. <laughs> um, but Congress is, was pressuring Jared Kushner recently um, within the past week on this data, health data surveillance that he's doing. And if you can see here on the right, here's, a, here's the actual letter that was writ written to Kushner talking about the serious concerns they have with the secrecy of the efforts that he was going, um, going about with big tech companies to create this kind of behind the scenes group of tech companies to collect and analyze healthcare data. Yes, with the purpose of helping COVID-19, but what regulation, what, um, you know, who is watching over the data that they're collecting and, and making sure that they're not using that data for other purposes for building up their database um, after the COVID-19 pandemic has passed. So just the, the, the wording here, I thought was just very powerful. Like they, the impact on the health privacy of Americans and talking about how this only compounds the concerns they have with the lack of transparency um, with initiative, but this initiative that he's working on. Um, coming from the healthcare space, I'm also really interested in um, the kind of like the, the digital health healthcare apps, the tel telehealth apps. Um, and this article also mentioned that these telehealth apps right now are clearly on the rise, but a lot of these apps, actually most of these act apps actually don't fall under the HIPAA regulations that um, like a normal doctor's office or um, anything of that nature would fall under. So we're also now seeing a lot of these healthcare applications collecting data and then having the ability without HIPAA restrictions to, to then sell that data on to another um, third party data purchaser. So just another thing, very, um, very recent to, to keep in mind when we're thinking about um, our, our, our data privacy, and especially for, you know, people like in my friends and family who say that they don't necessarily care about companies like Apple or Google having our data, it starts to get really personal when you start thinking about um, people knowing your, your healthcare data, your blood pressure, your sleep habits, and so on. And then last, you may have heard about this in Kentucky, somebody who refused to stay home and the judge actually ordered them to wear an ankle bracelet like they were on house arrest. So that's where we, it starts to really cross the line and, and make you a little bit worried and knowing that we need to start making changes. So given all that background, where do we go from here and what solutions are there to these, um, to these privacy issues? So one, um, I'm sure this is a crowd that is, is very aware of end-to-end -end encryption. Um, Signal obviously being the best messaging app for this um, purpose. Riot Chat is actually something that you may not be aware of. My entire company um, 
the Web3 Foundation actually operates on Riot, and the Matrix protocol is actually an end-to-end -end, end -end encrypted um, decentral or not decentralized, an end-to-end -end encrypted open source uh, technology that can be used um, by individuals, by organizations, and even by governments like we've seen in France. And then last, HTTPS encryption is has you know really reached I think 90-95% adoption, so that's another good good um, progression in that regard. On the regulation front, I uh, won't spend too much time on this, but uh, we, we've seen a lot of great progress with GDPR, the California Consumer Privacy Act, and then uh, the facial recognition bans that we've started to see in places that are you know more on the progressive end of things like San Francisco and Boston and, and um, cities like this around the United States. And last, uh, and these are just three examples of solutions, but the last example um, of a solution for uh, restoring privacy is, of course, um, the kind of the main topic of this presentation, which is decentralization and moving towards trustless technology. And I'll get into these um, concepts here in a second. So here we are in, in the year 2020, and um, we are starting to see the beginnings of Web 3.0. And one thing um, to keep in mind, the blockchain is definitely not the only component of Web 3.0. Um, these, you know, these four here are examples: AR, VR, artificial intelligence has massive potential. Internet of Things has already been growing and will continue to grow. Um, and then blockchain and cryptocurrency will play a a major role, especially at the foundational level, in what Web three what Web three point will become um, down the road. Web three point you may hear um, referred to as a semantic web, so um, humans and machines being able to interact based on logical reasoning and logical relationships um, instead of really just simplistic relationships um, with humans interacting with their the internet or their computers. Um, a user-centric web, so again, bringing kind of the power back into the hands of the individual, decentralizing and pulling away from these big monopolies. And then trustless, so getting away from these um, central authorities, these middlemen that we're having to trust our, our data, our money with, our information with, um, to not do something malicious with. So now I'll zero in um, on this of component of Web3. So Web3.0 in a blockchain context, um, we're really talking about, like I mentioned, bringing power back to individuals, removing powerful central points of control. So when you hear the word decentralization, it's all about taking um, you know, all of Facebook's servers in San Francisco or all of Google servers in San Francisco or um, all of Santander, Santander Bank's uh, servers in I believe they're in Madrid, just getting away from this model where an individual company or an individual organization owns everything and can, can control, can alter, and manipulate the data that they own. And then last, we, we have to remind ourselves that we are very lucky, especially at a time like this, um, where we're kind of being woken up to some realities that a lot of people in other parts of the world live with. Um, we are lucky enough to, I think most of us on this call are lucky enough to earn U.S. dollars, to live um, and save and earn U.S. dollars. Um, and we have access because of that to the banking system. We have access to the um, equities market. We have access to a lot of financial, um, you know, financial freedoms and benefits that a lot of people in other parts of the world, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, you name it, there's so many people who don't have the luxuries that we do and don't have access to banks. So part of one of the interesting use cases of blockchain is being able to bring this financial participation to, um, to individuals who may not be able to do so using the current system. So I'm gonna try to go somewhat slow here and just explain um, the best I can what blockchain is as a whole. Um, you know, many of you may have heard and know what blockchain is, so I apologize. But um, for those who may not be as familiar, um, I'll do my best to explain kind of the basic idea of what blockchain or what a blockchain is. 
um, give a couple of kind of analogies and examples, and then hopefully um, you can ask questions at the end if it's not quite clear, but it's fairly complicated trying to simplify. Um, so a, a blockchain at its core is a digital chain made up of blocks of information hosted on a decentralized and distributed network of computers that cannot be altered or changed. So this is illustrating a centralized point of control. So if there's information on this um, network, for example, it can be changed, it can be altered by whoever owns it. This is illustrating a distributed network, a decentralized network where there's not one uh, point of failure, there's not one point of uh, manipulation and the network is spread amongst a group of people or a group of organizations um, and even geographically dispersed. And I'll explain uh, more of this in, in an example next. Um, and then this is blocked by this Google thing, but it says uh, blocks are chunks of data. Um, sorry, I can't read this. Basically saying blocks are- that. If you click hide, you can hide there that. We there we go, thank you. So blocks are chunks of data um, collected over a specific period of time. So let me get into this in just one second. Here, here's an analogy that um, was explained to me once and really kind of made sense as far as what this blockchain is, what this ledger is. So a blockchain is very similar to this concept where imagine yourself at a poker table or imagine just watching these people play poker. After every hand, everyone records the results of each hand in their own notebook on the side. So they're, they're keeping tallies of who has how many chips. After the full game is complete, all the players agree on the chip counts and they finalize that game. So after game one, they all compare their notes and they say, yep, 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 you're right. Um, let's consider that a block. So that, that period of time was one game and that block has been agreed upon by all seven player, all eight players and finalized as a block and added to this hypothetical blockchain. They play two more games, and after the second game, they also took notes and agreed upon the results. After the third game, they did the same. Um, and now after the third game, they've all agreed three times. They've created three blocks of information based on those three games. But now one of the players, Kelly, is trying to cash out, and she's claiming that she has $100 more than she is actually owed. So here's the benefit of using a blockchain or using a ledger of information from the past that was agreed upon by multiple people. So everyone goes back and checks the records from the three previous games that were finalized and agreed upon by the group. Kelly's request is declined by the network. It's declined by the seven other people because she didn't actually um, earn $100 more than that. She um, was then paid what she is truly owed. So. Hopefully that explains kind of how this ledger works and how the network, um, imagine these being servers and having to agree upon a specific, um, you know, a specific unit of information in a specific period of time. So sorry for the busy slide here. Here's just like a little bit more of a real example of, of block a blockchain example, um, very basic, but these are now, I'm, I'm giving it a, a date. So each block is one, one day. So you have April 12th, um, it shows the account balances, it shows what happened during that period, and then it shows the end account. And of course the end moves up here. Um, so now here's April 13th. Um, this block was finalized. This information was kind of agreed upon by the network and set in stone after this day. Then we came over here, more action took place, finalized. Then we came to the 14th, Everything happened, finalized, and then the 15th. So we ended with um, me having 500K, Kevin having zero, and Bill having 4.5 million. So here's those four blocks. And they, these four blocks, these four days of information or transactions have all been added to the chain, the chain of blocks, um, creating a blockchain. And these, this blockchain could technically be hosted on a centralized server like Facebook or Google or any, 
any uh, honestly any Fortune 500 company today, they they own their servers and they own all the information. But these, if you can see these colors here, this blockchain is also um, in this case, let's say it's added to this decentralized network. So just like the poker table, these are all the poker players. They all know exactly what happened in the pink block, in the the blue block, in the orange block, and the teal block. And they all have agreed upon what happened in the past and what happened in the blocks preceding each each uh, specific block. So think back to this centralized server. Now let's imagine uh, Kevin, or sorry, let's imagine Bill owns this server and he he wants to be paid 500k more. So what's stopping him from going into the record, deleting this transaction? updating it to say that I paid him a million, and then he runs away with his five million. It's, it's really no different than, um, you know, the exposure to hackers that we've seen with, with organizations like Equifax. It's no different than um, some of the accounting scandals that we've seen in the past, because when people own the database, they own the data, they can do whatever they want with it. Now here is a kind of a visual in, Apologies if this is um, if this is fairly technical, but this is kind of how a blockchain network looks today. Like this is what Ethereum looks like today, but way more way more servers, way more um, you know global breadth. But imagine the same blockchain that was on uh, this server that was able to be edited by Bill. This is a, a situation where it's it's nearly impossible to alter a record because if this if this server say whoever is running the server in it looks like Russia um, say they want to change the data of this blue block the second block from April 15th all these other networks all these other servers all these other poker players from our example would all immediately say no that's not true because that's not what we agreed upon at the end of that block so that um, you know, that change to that record would be declined and the network would go on um, with their business. So hopefully that's, I know it's somewhat, somewhat complicated, but for those of you who are new to blockchain, hopefully you can kind of understand like even just what the name blockchain means. It's literally a chain of blocks of information. Um, but just like these examples on the previous slides, we're talking about uh, there. The one example was talking about kind of like a financial information, but financial data on the blockchain can be the same as, um, you know, drug supply chain information or um, identity. So in this case with identity, this is a very interesting topic that a lot of these uh, blockchain organizations are working on, which is the concept of you owning your own identity in some kind of a digital wallet. So instead of like it's, it blows my mind that we still like I still have to worry about a piece of paper for me to get out of like Germany to get back to the US. If I lose my passport, I'm screwed and I have to go to the, you know, the American consulate or, or whatever to get my new passport to get home. But imagine then hopefully in the next 10 years, I have my passport in my encrypted digital wallet on my phone. I own the private key or I own the password to that and only I can get in that. Um, and I can choose who I give my identity to. So I can, maybe I'll scan my thumb and give my ID to, um, you know, TSA when I get back to Washington, D.C., um, but I have control over when I own it or when, when I give my identity up to someone. Anonymous logins is another interesting concept, uh, sp especially with regards to privacy. So if you think about every time you sign up for a new, um, maybe a new, it, any service on the internet that has this these buttons to make it easy, um, easy login with Facebook, easy login with Google, they're probably collecting God knows how many pictures and birthdays and friends that I have on Facebook just to make it seem easy to the user when I log in. We're also seeing a lot of people even at my organization working on um, what they call like Web3 logins or pseudo anonymous or anonymous logins to allow us to take part in some of these services or, um, you know, marketplaces without having to give up so much of our, our identity or our data. 
And then last, this is another thing that just blows my mind. I, I was stuck in, I was in Brazil trying to go to a meetup in Colombia and I didn't have a yellow fever in immunization form to show the Brazilian uh, airlines. So I wasn't allowed to fly to Colombia. I had to cancel my trip and fly back to the US. I started thinking like, I wouldn't even know where to begin finding my immunizations rec records after living in you know, Northern Indiana, going to college in a different city, living in Indianapolis, moving to Austin, Texas. Like, when did I get that? Sh it's, it's, I don't know where to even begin, but it's just, it's, we need to get to the point where just like with the digital identity, we all will own our healthcare data in some kind of an encrypted digital application, call it a wallet, where I own all of my previous um, records from doctor's visits, I own immunization records, and I can choose to give my healthcare data to um, a dentist, or I can choose to give my healthcare data to um, a physician or whatever the, the use case is. So these are just a three or four, these are just four examples of um, different use cases among many, many different use cases, but just a few that I thought would make some sense to this group. So brief um, kind of history here of, of blockchain and something that's um, pretty interesting to keep in mind is that a lot of people, including myself, before I really got deep into this industry, think that Bitcoin was just kind of this magical thing that, um, you know, sprouted up in 2009. But in reality, this actually dates back to this guy, David Chom. He's a kind of a legend in the, the industry, still, still working on a project now, but came up with this concept of digital cash back in the early 80s. Um, this concept, be, you know, continued to evolve into hash cash in 1997. Um, and these are all things that you can Google and they're pretty interesting to read the history on. But hash cash was kind of like the first, I would say like the first version of Bitcoin almost because Bitcoin has this hashing um, capability that is very technical, but you can also Google that later. Um, and then Bitcoin came around in 2009, which is very interesting timing, just following the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and that led on to 2015. 20, so 2014 or 2015 um, is when Ethereum started getting built. Um, Bitcoin um, at this point was really just a peer-to-peer -peer kind of payment mechanism. Um, what Ethereum did was it added what's called smart contracts. So um, it's basically the ability to, to program something or add um, it's basically adding programmability to on top of kind of this payment layer. So now you're seeing on Ethereum a lot of what they call dApps, a decentralized application for so many use cases, including identity, like I mentioned. But um, probably the biggest area on Ethereum right now of, of growth is what they're calling decentralized finance or DeFi. Um, so that's kind of where Ethereum is today. Going back to 2015, when Ethereum launched, um, like Kevin mentioned in the, the intro, um, Gavin Wood was one of the original co-founders. He invented the, the Solidity programming language that's actually used to build on Ethereum. He left um, at that time and dedicated all of his time and focus on building this project called Polkadot. So it's been the name and the project has been around for quite some time, um, around two or three years, and has really been kind of under wraps. Um, the whole team has been heads down focused on building this. Um, but the reason I'm working on this project and the reason I'm here is really because I, I tr I'm I'm pretty confident this is the third you know major innovation in this industry. Um, and part of the goal today, I'm definitely not going to go super deep in Polkadot because it's very complex technologically. Um, but the goal here is just to kind of like, you know, give you the awareness that Polkadot's coming. Just keep your eye out for it. It's really interesting what Polkadot is doing um, and what I think it's going to enable in terms of blockchain adoption and the ability to actually scale and handle transactions to the level of like a Visa or one of these organizations today. So this is a very busy slide, but really meant to show you how many 
aspects there are to Web3. Um, like I mentioned before, the smart contracts on Ethereum is really what kind of sparked this next step in the, the, the history of this industry. Um, this is basically the way this is set up is going from the base layer protocol. Um, and when protocol is a pretty technical word, but you can think back to like TCP IP in the early internet when I was mentioning that. And as you head up, these are this is like the application layer, the the browser layer. So here's Brave browser, which many of you probably have heard of. Um, and this is really where we'll start to see applications, um, and hopefully soon, um, applications that can be used by normal everyday users. Um, in my opinion, people should never even know that there's a blockchain behind it. If they are, if they do know, it's probably a problem because it's probably not a great user experience. Um, so this is, you know, a lot of the the work and innovation that's being done today in Web3. And this is actually built by Multicoin Capital, which is based in Austin, which is pretty cool. So the history going from Bitcoin to Ethereum to now, before Polkadot is launched, this is currently the way the the blockchain organ or the blockchain ecosystem is operating. Everything that's being done on Bitcoin is separate from everything being done on Ethereum, which is also separate from everything being done on Tezos, which is another blockchain platform. If you think back to this map, this is the same thing as the US not being able to communicate with Sao Paulo or Australia operating on this island with no connection to anything else on Earth. Um, and same with every other continent. This is how the blockchain organization is operating today. And a, a big reason why you haven't seen like full mainstream adoption of blockchain and all the promise that it has. So this is why I was mentioning this, this part of the slide earlier. These technologies helped connect internet networks of the, the 90s. So you had these low level app, like protocol layer um, technologies that I couldn't even come close to understanding how they actually work, but what they enabled was this application layer of Facebook, of Chrome, of YouTube, because we had the connectivity of networks across the world. We're seeing the exact same thing now and that's what Polkadot is building. It's the equivalent to this low level protocol connectivity that we saw here. We're building consensus mechanisms. We're building what's called cross-chain message passing. We're building bridges to existing networks, um, which all this stuff is go not gonna be um, consumer facing. But then this is where the, the, you know, the really exciting and fun part comes. So we've got, an or we've got a company based out of the Ukraine building what's called SubSocial. So this is a platform for building social networks that aren't owned by any one entity. They're decentralized social networks. So it's the beginnings of a decentralized Facebook. There's another one, Akala, based out of uh, New Zealand, and they're building a very, very exciting and interesting platform um, for decentralized finance, for everything from synthetic asset trading to margin trading on crypto and on traditional assets, um, but again, all in a decentralized manner. And then Brave, of course, just wanted to include that because it's such a well-known name and they are already in doing great work in the Web3 space. So here's just a, we have an amazing designer at, at Polkadot. Um, so Iggy made this um, just to kind of represent what Polkadot is. So I won't get into the specifics. I can um, either send a prior presentation if people are interested in how Polkadot works at at the you know the the technology level, um, but essentially these little squares are all blockchains. So this one square here is the equivalent to Ethereum. This one is equivalent to Tezos. So we're going to have a huge network of connected blockchains that will all interact, um, you know, with information, with data, with with value, um, and this will allow applications built on custom blockchains to interact with one another and interact with legacy networks like Ethereum and Bitcoin, Tezos, and then Hyperledger being kind of a um, enterprise or, or private, private blockchain focused or consortium blockchain. Um, 
this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but just to explain kind of why I and a lot of people are so excited about what's coming with Polkadot, just because it's finally connecting everything together at, at its basic, at the basic notion. So to kind of start wrapping things up, we're obviously here in the year 2020, 2020 um, and Web 3 and Web 2 are both going on at the same time. So the people at the Web3 Foundation, um, the people that are building these technologies, they have a lot of choices now with where we take this. So one thing, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday um, called Relay Chain, and they had a really interesting topic around making sure that we build Web3 and, and keep users in mind and keep the principles of what we're trying to achieve in mind because it's very easy to quickly um, you know, veer towards the way Web 2 went and forget about what, what it's all about. So that's why I add here, we must build with the users and Web 3 principles first and protect against, you know, a re-aggregation of power. Um, the same thing that happened with Web 2 at the application layer, at the company layer, when um, things started shifting into the hands of these big monopolies. This is kind of similar to what I already mentioned before, but just to reiterate that blockchain in general is, it's going to take some time. Um, Polkadot, like I mentioned, is a protocol layer. It's kind of the base layer that all these incredibly smart developers are building on top of. So when you think about like how, if you ask, how does Polkadot help, like how does Polkadot's decentralized or blockchain technology help uh, privacy? It's more so that we're building like these building blocks for developers who are going to build these applications on top. So developers can leverage all the benefits of tech of uh, blockchain, including the trustlessness, the immutability, and the security of blockchain, and, and um, hopefully set them up to be able to build things that will change the world for the better. That is it. Um, Hopefully you learned something new. I included a few things, like always always like to include just little tidbits that might be interesting to you. So of course, on the privacy front, you guys are already doing better than 99.9% .9 of the population. Um, coming to meetups like this, the great hack was, was huge for me to watch um, when I watched that last year. So if you haven't seen that yet, it would definitely hit home with you, especially with the election happening this year. Um, privacy project from New York Times I mentioned, Brave and Signal. And then if you're interested in learning more about Polkadot, happy to, to talk to you about that. Um, and then if you are technical, we have a very talented uh, technical education and kind of developer advocacy team. Um, so substrate.dev has a lot of tutorials. So you can actually follow step-by-step -step instructions and spin up your own blockchain in a matter of probably... 30 minutes, 45 minutes, which is pretty cool. Um, and then Bill from the Web3 Foundation, he is a he was a um, you know a technology and blockchain professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and he left uh, that role to to move to Switzerland, and now he's heading up our technical education for the Web3 Foundation. And he just kicked off this uh, class. It's actually happening every Wednesday, um, so it's start it's happening tomorrow, week two. So you're only one week behind if you do want to. Um, get, kind of get into the technology, but also he's starting with the basics. So the history and then each class is around 20 minutes or so, and then there's a little homework assignment. So that's actually really, it's really good and really cool. Um, and I'm doing it myself. So if anyone's interested in doing that, you can just Google Web3 MOOC and should be able to find more information on that. And then here's my contact info if you want to talk for any reason and um, I guess now we can open it up to questions. Um, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Dan. A uh, very informative presentation. I think it uh, struck a good line between uh, accessible for people, um, but also getting into some of the real issues and topics as well. Um, I guess I'll start off questions and then we can go to some other people. I actually have. I had a couple questions, and so I think I will kind of present them. I'm curious your thoughts. My first one would kind of be directed about the privacy potential of um, 
of blockchain technology. As some of us know who've been following early applications of blockchain like Bitcoin, we know that Bitcoin in the way it was designed proves somewhat susceptible to the reassertion of centralized control, which you alluded a little bit to in your presentation. Infamously, it got to the point where there were like just a couple servers in China that were controlling the vast majority of the blockchain's processing power, which meant the whole example you alluded to of, well, if there's only a couple databases, it's very easy to edit the record. And so how is um, Polkadot trying to circumvent the centralization of control of the blockchain that emerged in Bitcoin? And I guess my second question um, would be about, as far as building these protocols and adoption, um, I'm curious how much of this involves browsers. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Watching myself was a little funny. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, um, I'm curious how much um, this involves browsers like Brave providing support for the protocols to drive adoption. Like I think about how we now with modern web browsers have things like session local storage to replace the limitations of, you know, cookies from the 90s. And I'm wondering, is is Polkadot going to need web browsers to essentially adopt full blockchain database management systems running in browser? Or is, is, is technological developments like that ultimately not going to be necessary with the approach Polkadot's taking? Yeah. Two great questions. So on the first one, um, so basically you're saying that Bitcoin mining became really centralized um, and how is Polkadot going to solve that? So that is, that's a great point. Um, the way that Polkadot is approaching that issue is that, first of all, Bitcoin, and this is getting into the technical weeds, so apologies, but um, it kind of requires that kind of an answer. So Bitcoin is, is ran by what's called proof of work. So that's why there's so much computing power that needs to go in um, and why there's so much money to be made by people who you know aggregate as much computing power as they can to, to win or to get rewarded in as much Bitcoin as possible. Um, Polkadot is, and what Ethereum is moving to, is run by what's called proof of stake. So instead of um, instead of the network being run, or instead of your um, reward coming for the amount of computing power that you're contributing, it's actually based on the amount that you have at stake, or the amount that you have um, at at risk, or kind of like held in a in a account, basically. So. Polkadot will have, we have a whole set of what we call validators, and these validators are the equivalent to a miner on Bitcoin. And Polkadot, as of now, the research team is saying we have the ability to scale up to 1,000 validators, um, which will run the network. But the way that the proof of stake mechanism is set up is that the, the, when you're staking, so I as a, an individual can stake my money just like somebody in Bitcoin can kind of contribute to a mining pool. But with Polkadot, when you're contributing to a validator, the money is automatically dispersed evenly among the whole set of validators. So with other networks like EOS, if you really want to get into the, the technicals, EOS is extremely top heavy because they don't have a mechanism for kind of equaling out the distribution of, of funds that are staked. So that's the basic explanation is that we have a mechanism to equally disperse the funds that are at stake in the network so that it doesn't become, there's not a single point of too much, um, I guess, too much ability to alter or change something on the network based on the amount that they- There's not a central point of failure where some nodes in the network are more important than other nodes in the network. Exactly. Hopefully that helps. Um, I can kind of do like some of the people like Bill, who I mentioned, who are really good at explaining um, this kind of stuff. Um, your other question was about Polkadot needing web browsers. So this is also probably over my head in terms of the tech. Um, the best answer I can give is that you will need a browser. You will need a UI to be able to interact with um, with 
Polkadot. So right now, Polkadot actually has a kind of a mirror network that's already live called Kusama. And if you go to Polkadot, I believe it's polkadot.js.org, you can already, that's the UI right now, and you can already interact with the, the on-chain governance that's live. This is where you set up your validator node. This is where you nominate or stake with the validator on the network. So yes, I'm I'm fairly positive that a browser or a UI is needed. Um, and that's where, like I mentioned, a Kala network or any of the other test nets that are coming up from these projects that are building on top of Polkadot, that's where all of their test nets are too in terms of their UI. It's all on that um, Polkadot.js um, browser. So, so hopefully that's kind of what you were looking for. Yeah, no, no, I, I think those were uh, great answers. And, and yeah, I realized they, they got a little technical, but, you know, I uh, figured we need to go a little bit into some more technical yeah. just because, yeah, you know, those of us who have followed it a bit have heard things like the limitations of Bitcoin. And, you know, as I've always told people, you know, I've been aware slash following blockchain technologies like Bitcoin for quite a while. So, you know, I hear the stories about the limitations. And the way I've always put it is I'm very bullish on all the potential behind blockchain. I'm just skeptical on Bitcoin as a specific application of blockchain. So it's it's very exciting to see you guys trying to, you know, really iterate it and learn on maybe some of the early noble attempts that may ultimately not succeed. So uh, yeah, no, that, that was definitely, I think, a nice intro without going deep into a research paper level to my questions there. Um, so yeah, who else has some questions for Dan? I guess unmute yourself and uh, try to keep it polite and civil and don't make me be forced to mute any of you. But yeah, uh, who has a question for Dan? Uh, if I could. Uh, yeah. Hey, what's up, Dan? Um, we, we met a while back at the uh, Basic Attention Taco meetup. And um, just so folks know, you might look at my ID card and says BMO Studio, but during my day job, I happen to be the product manager in charge of rewards for Brave. Um, so uh, just a point of clarification. Oh, wow. Shout out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's nice to meet locals who are into this. Um, and I, I just wanted to add a, a slight point of clarification. We don't run uh, any blockchain uh, like hashing or anything else like that inside of the browser proper. Uh, you, we do use zero knowledge proofs, but that, that's very, very into the weeds. It's just to say that your CPU is not grinding uh, because of stuff that's strictly related to rewards. Just in case that helps, uh, it, a lot of that's handled server side. Um, so it, it is a, a thin client in that regard. And I think that Dan brought up a, a really good clarification that like some kind of UI will probably be needed. Um, but I, I think it's a very fair point to say, do you call it a browser or not? Is it a browser because it points at a technology hosted over the internet? I mean, you, you, the, does, a chat, does a chat system count as a browser in that instance if it's using say HTTP and uh, w, you know, WebRTC to send you know, messages back and forth, right? Where does that line blur? I think it's a really good question to ask. But I, I guess to take the point you're sort of making there about, you know, like a thin client, really the heavy lifting is going to be done by the protocols that enable this technology and let the network communicate. Each individual client really doesn't need that much going on to be able to interpret the network and the protocol and make it human interactable. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's always going to be a flex, and, and Dan can definitely speak to this as well, uh, that, that there's the amount of heavy lifting that's done, you can have a thick client and and you can, you know, hash Bitcoin and at the same time interact with it. And same with Ethereum, right? That like, you can do that, um, but you don't have to. You, you can also delegate out to exchanges and et cetera to, to do some of that heavy lifting for you. Right, and I, th I think that's important, especially because if we want to see widespread adoption you know the the reason that we currently have an internet say like for social media dominated by a facebook and not people running their own individual wordpress blogs is because well you have to have a technology as simple as facebook if you want it to win the adoption more so i think if you want to say this adopted it, it can't involve being a really technical nerd like a lot of us are in this conversation it's got to be really easy <laughs> Um, yeah, well, 
don't be shy. I don't want Dan to feel like there isn't interest. I mean, now I can keep asking questions, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. So, um, anybody else? I was just going to ask one more. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, yeah, why don't you? Because I don't want to pass all of them. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Dan, I was wondering if you could clarify for me: does does the network necessarily need to run on so on top of TCP/IP, or could you use like something else underlaying it. Like for example, if I want to use uh, Tor Hidden Services or more specifically like I2P and they, they use their own kind of like special routing protocols that don't kind of run uh, quite in the clear. Could you clarify on, on like, you know, what can you, what kind of stacks, like transport stacks can you set this on top of? Yeah, I actually <laughs> can't answer that. I was actually gonna ask the same question to our team today. Um, I'm not 100% sure if if Polkadot can run on a network like Tor, um, but it would be it would be really interesting. Um, what I can do, I have your contact info. Let me just follow up on that and get an answer. Um, but I think because I think it would be good for both of us to know. Totally, and it'd just be good to keep in touch, anyways, for social. Sure. <laughs> it's good seeing you again. You too. We got, we got some other people that have questions and, you know, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, I will keep trying to think of interesting things to ask until, you know, they're not good questions anymore. But uh, by all means, we want to hear diversity of opinion. And, and so especially if you're somebody who maybe isn't quite as much on the technical side and, and doesn't want to ask these deep technical questions, but just really has questions more at the what are the implications for my life for society? I mean, just we, we try to encourage that conversation here as well. So uh, don't feel like you don't have a good question just because you don't know how a hashing algorithm works. Um, and it'd be but, yeah. to hear from somebody who didn't know what blockchain was prior to today, if, if they have any questions or if that helped, because um, I did yeah. my best to make it understandable, but it's hard. I mean, speaking for myself, I thought you did a good job. And uh, speaking from uh, at least one person who I know has been tuning in, participating, they said that uh, your explanation was very clear. So I, I think you did a good job on that front. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I come from a totally different area, and that's investing. And that's why I got on here because I would, I'm an accountant, um, but retired and now I'm an investor. And so and I'm, you know, I love tech, <laughs> but so I was looking at this for the uh, companies that are building and developing and that kind of thing. Um, and then Dan, you had a slide there with a lot of companies involved in the, in the 3.0, right? Um, where would I go to get myself educated on these type of companies and what they are and who they are and that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question, and Alex can probably help me with this. But there's there's not a shortage of companies uh, building in this space. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, um, and I mean to that point, it it kind of ties into what I was sort of thinking about too. For those of us who believe in the potential of this, but want to know who's actually doing good work. Who are the people that if we sink a few thousand into them now, we might not regret that in five, 10 years time. Yeah, I definitely don't want to give any investment advice, um, but- Well, no, I, I understand. Ask for it, not a, a, you know, fiduciary <laughs> advisor, understood. <laughs> a lot of these, so one thing I really do like in terms of the way the industry has progressed is that we're getting away from the like the 2017 hype, and a lot of these organizations now are raising legit money from VCs and from really educated investors um, in you know in San Francisco, in Europe, all over the, in, in Asia. Um, yes, it's it's somewhat difficult, especially if you're not very technical, to identify what's like what's real, what's legit, and what's not. Um, yeah. I can I can send you at least um, so MultiCoin Capital is based in Austin. They're a really great place to at least just start, like reading some of their reports. I think they even do like investment oh. reports. So they're they're a big like they're in Austin, but they are a global, very big name um, in the space and highly. Oh. So they have a couple guys that lead that 
Um, I, they're, they're a fund or whatever they call it, uh, but they're a great place to start. They're the one who actually created that diagram that I showed. So that's, oh. that's at least the place to get in and start um, looking up some of these organizations or, or companies. Um, as far as investment, like maybe, maybe talking to them, um, picking their brain on what they think are the best up and coming platforms or applications. Um, on the other hand, so there's that's one place. I mean, the other is just getting plugged into the media outlets within this industry. So yeah, the, like yeah, I would say that's the actually market. that's a nice one point. Like yeah, what what blogs are like reliable to actually get yeah. good information about the space? Because there's certainly plenty of like grifty blogs. I've run across a number of them in my time. Yep, the I would say the top tier. Wall Street Journal ask is CoinDesk, so C O I N D E S K. That's kind of the the most respected um, in the industry. There's a few others. I think the Block is really good. Um, Coin Telegraph. Alex, do you have any others? There, there's a there's about five or six that are kind of like. Can you spell those again? Is it Q U I N? Uh, I think Coin. C O I N. Coin. Oh, is it Oh, coin, okay. <laughs> C-O-I-N-D-E-S-K, yeah. I, I've seen CoinDesk before. Oh, CoinDesk. Yeah. Yes, I'm familiar. Yep. Okay. And then the block is another. Coin Telegraph is another. Oh. I, I would agree with Dan on all of those. And I'd say, you know, um, if you don't mind kind of diving into the weeds a little bit more, then... There's a you know probably a solid handful of people worth following on Twitter and yeah. um, and of course a few subreddits to dive into as well uh, if you're into using Reddit um, you know they they have their mix of hype and truth and somewhere in the middle but um, yeah is there, is there sort of anybody who's an equivalent in this space to like Bruce Schneier in the security space of like the guru who's the person you should be listening to. You know, in coins, when it comes to coins in particular, um, I, I'll, I'll share a personal opinion on this. I, I feel as though the coin space ran into kind of a, a zero-sum game hype problem, uh, especially as everybody's trying to draw attention with the different initial coin offerings and, you know, trying to pump their prices and et cetera. Um, that led to uh, a very real problem as it comes to established base truth in any one of those projects. And so then what you have to do is you have to rely on secondary indicators, like what's the size of the team, what's the location and training of the team, and um, do they have an open source repo, and can you see the contributions that they're making on a regular basis? Um, and you know, go and visiting their website and seeing what kind of features, what's the cadence of the features that they're landing on a regular basis, which is a lot of like grunt work, uh, but I don't, find, I don't find there to be like a singular voice that I listen to in terms of this, that is truly Schneier-esque um, as an as a honest to God leader. Um, I think there's a handful of people and I try and, I try and take the chorus and, and hear like, you know, what, what notes are they all landing on, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of my takeaway on that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Alex brings up a good point. The, the crypto and blockchain industry is pretty unique and interesting in that it's very centered around Twitter. So people call it crypto Twitter. Can you guys hear me? Perfectly. You're doing yeah, great. Yeah. Just like Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can. Cool. Yeah. So crypt crypto Twitter is like a it's a great place to follow if you really want to start seeing some of these big voices. Um, I can I can actually just write some of these down and send them to Kevin as a follow up. But there's a couple. Um, Especially, especially in Bitcoin itself, um, there's there's two two ladies, uh, Mel from the Mirrors. During the big uh, Facebook Libra cryptocurrency trial, or not trials, but hearings um, in DC, Mel from the Mirrors made a big name for herself because she did an amazing job um, during that time, and she's she's become one of the big voices and respected voices in the industry. Another one is uh, Caitlin Long. So she is doing a lot of great work out of Wyoming on the kind of legal and regulatory front and advocating for blockchain. Um, and I've seen her speak once and she's phenomenal. So she's 
another one that I really, I actually have notifications for whatever she tweets. She's great. Um, there's, a, there's a handful of others, and I can maybe just send some of these to Kevin in a follow up. Okay. If you want to separate okay, the, thank you. if you want to separate out the coin discussion from the rest of the distributed tech discussion, which is like the other three quarters of the pie, uh, as Dan was kind of showing there, um, then you know I think that the Internet Freedom Festival is one direction to look in. Um, I think that there's a handful of privacy and security conferences that um, they publish, aside from the white papers, they tend to highlight the technologies that are active in that space uh, on a regular basis. And, um, you know, those are a few things I would look at. Um, oddly enough, I think hacker conferences are amazing for this. Yeah. So if you look at, say, DEF CON and Hackers on Planet Earth, I think that they're both really interesting spaces. And of course, the EFF, uh, you know, the, the, this is just like, well, uh, you know, well, yes, I, I feel very, very privileged. Some of the communities I'm networked in that I feel I, I avoid a little bit of the grift. I, I'm just kind of curious because I think, you know, one thing a lot of people looking on the outside in is they do want to know how to like develop sort of a smell for bullshit in this space. There's become kind of a running joke that companies will just slap blockchain on their name to fool dumb investors and ride their stock up, you know, and, and we hear stories about like, that that uh, crypto queen Ruja Ignatova, you know, scamming people out of billions, and and I think I don't know. Have either of you kind of like developed any rough rubrics for like a smell test of how you know that something is total bullshit or a scam in this space versus like? And I know it's so hard without actually digging in the weeds of what a company does. But since we are an educational organization, I'm like, for the people listening, is there anything that's like really a repeated red flag that keeps popping up in these scams again and again? I think the it's pretty easy to avoid them now, honestly. Like if, you, if you're a legitimate project in the space, you're going to go to VC first. So if I was like if I was investing, I probably wouldn't like I'm not going to have insight into something before a VC does. So if if a legitimate VC hasn't invested yet, then I'm I would stay away. Um, yeah. No, that's just that's just one. No, I mean that you know. that sounds fair, and I mean I, I think that's a decent. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's a wonderfully one-word simple rule. Are there VCs investing in it? So I think that's the level of simplicity I was looking for there. Um, and I guess, um, and Alex, um, you were uh, alluding, um, you know, you were talking about various conferences and things to get involved in. Um, you know, I tried to stay as much aware of things going on, especially in the Austin space. Are there any things in that space going on in the Austin area that you think our participants should be aware of? I mean, there's my virtual conference that's going on at the end of May, but uh, that's virtual. Right, right, <laughs> which, which as I, and to anybody who has, uh, wants to share things or as feedback in general, there's, you know, there's our public pages, which you can comment on as well. But I'll just say right now, you know, you can email me at kevin.welch at effaustin.org. Um, and, and I'm happy to try to disseminate information, especially also if that goes for anybody who has feedback in general about this, um, you know, first time we've done these. So uh, be harsh if you need to be. I, I want to figure out how we can do these well. But um, but yeah, if you have uh, <laughs> info about your conference in May, Alex, as well as just any other thing going on in the local area, because um, I just try to know about everything so I can inform people. So uh, yeah, that all sounds uh, good. Um, and, and actually, Alex, um, I don't know. Um, you know, we're always looking for uh, speakers. You know, if you'd like to come talk to us something about Brave at some point, that could be a really good conversation because obviously. Brave is like the only other browser besides Firefox that I tend not to badmouth. So it could be interesting to discuss where the Brave project is right now. Uh, I would love to. I'd be honored, and uh, and I'll take the badmouthing too because uh, critique is the is the pathway to improvement. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else still in the conversation who uh, has some questions um, about you know specifics of Polkadot or just about blockchain in general? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Daniel Smith. I, I didn't see my name in the list of the people I signed on as a guest. Uh, maybe that's why. Uh, okay. Well, I see you there, so you're here. Okay, that's fine. I um I was watching Polkadot for about a year now, and I actually wrote to Gavin Wood uh, back then, and I was asking him 
about how it was working because uh, in 2017 there was a very large interest in 2018 in privacy coins, not meaning privacy in the sense that you're talking about privacy in the EFF, but people basically being able to hide money or keep their coins private, you know, so everybody didn't know where, uh, where their funds were particularly. And I just wondered, uh, and he had mentioned a few things back then when he I emailed him, but I wondered how it was approached with that as far as some of these chains um, are varying levels of transparency and how that would be approached in the system. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, what do you say, Dan? Uh, I mean, it's not a pretty technical question, but I just thought, you know, it was something to bring up because that, it's very interesting how it would go across all these different coins. How does it translate between one to the other? That's a, a really good question and kind of stumped me again. Uh, okay. What I will say is that we actually had a presentation this morning from um, one of our best researchers, or actually two of our best researchers, and this was part of the presentation as like what's coming. So we have relatively small team compared to a lot of these you know, big Fortune 500. So we are we are building Polkadot, and our sole focus is launching Polkadot in its first kind of phase. Um, but what we were told today is that there are definitely some privacy features that are in the plans, in the works, um, coming down the road. I don't know specifically how that will work, and I can actually follow up with um, Alistair, our researcher, on how that may look. Um, another thing that we are, are going to see is, like I mentioned earlier, bridges. So we're going to see bridges to Bitcoin and bridges to Ethereum. Um, but another network's name that has come up in the past is Zcash. So we could also see a potential integration with an existing privacy-focused network. Um, for that for that capability in the meantime, so we have a lot of pro a lot of um, grants that we're giving out to teams building these bridges. Um, so that's probably some maybe that could come first, um, but then down the road we'll see some kind of privacy features and in integ integrated into Polkadot. But I'm just not it's probably not far along yet um, enough yet to really elaborate on that. But I can follow up with you, Daniel. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I just muted you because we we're having a little feedback. That's okay. I was going to say that the background on the web, too, the, the history of it was really excellent. It went through all the, uh, I, they used to call web 2.0 semantic web, you know, but other than that, every single thing you said was very, uh, it was a great synopsis of the whole internet history. Good to hear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go off now. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Okay. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs> We're trying. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, we got any other questions for anybody? I have a few more of my own I can ask if uh, people don't. But um, but um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, all right. So I, I have a few potential questions. Um, one would be, Obviously, for anybody whose financial power or social power benefits from the Web 2.0 centralization, both of financial markets under uh, you know, central banks or under social networks via a Facebook or whatever, as far as the centralization of advertising revenue, people like this aren't necessarily going to uh, like the rollout of these technologies. I'm curious, I mean, I'm sure Polkadot, you know, your staff are very smart people. You're all aware of this. I'm curious what Polkadot is doing to sort of try to head off at the pass any potential attempts to kill these technologies in their infancy from those who really would not want to see us pivot in this direction. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. So first, I think, I mean, the reason why uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have had such success so far is that they are just by definition a decentralized technology that is impossible, nearly impossible to stop. 
So for us to get to that level, um, what we're trying to do and what we are doing right now is just decentralizing as quickly as possible um, to become a network that's basically owned by all the network participants and not owned by Gavin Wood or, or any of the um, people kind of in the core group of developers. Um, so that's one way of, I guess, avoiding being killed or like held back by any major web two company or government or, or whatever. Um, the other thing that I'll just add on that topic is just the slide that I had showing like web two and web three are now both um, being developed in parallel. Um, and I was actually talking to my girlfriend about this last night and she was asking, so when, like, when are people like me gonna actually be able to use this? <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a great question. Like there's, there's an aspect to this of that, number one, we're very early still. It's almost like the mid nineties in terms of the internet. But number two is that although this is all about, and this is just my opinion, but although this is just, this is all about decentralizing there's still probably, at least in the interim, going to be a need for central some component of centralization to in to in improve user experience. So you're already seeing in Web 2.0. I mean, obviously we're in the traditional world. We have banks who own our money, and that's extremely centralized, and that's that's that world. But now we're moving into crypto, where some people are operating exclusively in cryptocurrency. But you have one of the most successful companies in the space so far is Coinbase, based out of San Francisco. Um, they are a centralized exchange where people can buy and sell and hold cryptocurrency, but it's centralized. They own the, the keys to your wallet. So technically, they know what you're doing. They can report what you're doing to the government and so on. But most people, most consumers are okay with that because it's way easier than managing your own hardware wallet to store your Bitcoin. The experience is better. And because although we're trying to get away from trust, people trust Coinbase. It's just the fact of the matter. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think you raise a good point there because, you know, even I like, you know, I've, I've dabbled a little bit in the Bitcoin space, not compared to you and probably the people of Polkadot, obviously, but like, you know, yeah, the, the whopping, hundred dollar fortune of bitcoin i have like you know i'm basically having gemini manage my wallet for me because so you know, that obviates yeah. all the having to make sure my private key doesn't get lost if i change machines you know and and like which is a thing because you know my my brother bought bitcoin a decade ago back when it was worthless and uh that he has a very large sum of Bitcoin that has been lost forever because of a computer dying, you know, and it's like, oh, that would have been a lot of money, you know, so yeah. these are real problems. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, and that actually is an interesting question, like, like how, so, you know, it's, it's kind of the tug, push and pull between centralization and decentralization that traditionally centralization wins out precisely because you know, it's expensive for the for expertise to manage complex solutions and systems. Like you talk about, you know, will will initially need centralization. I mean, how do we ultimately move though to pure decentralization when these technologies are so complicated? Like, how is Polkadot handling problems like, you know, people change their their phone or their computer and and they don't want to lose their digital money or their digital smart contract, but they're not some really technically savvy person who wants to deal with backing up files and syncing files. And like, what, what are some of the long-term approaches Polkadot's taking to these problems? Or I mean, I assume it's at least been thought about. Yeah, we're so early and also so low level, like those right, right. diagrams I was showing, like we are the base layer. So right. Right now, like like I mentioned, our focus is on launching Polkadot at the technical level, and then we're going to have a lot right. of a lot of things built on top of that. Um, but there's a it's a need it's a need across the industry of like how do we create applications that are scalable and usable by my grandparents? Like my my grandma texts me with emojis, and it's easy for her. Like. And she loves it because Apple made it super simple and understandable. But now, like, I'm pretty technically savvy. And a lot of these 
decentralized applications, I don't even want to get close to because it's just like a bad experience. It's too hard to use. So all that being said. You, right. I mean, you totally gloss over the actual technical complexities of how do these 10,000 copies of the blockchain all synchronize with each other, you know, yeah. like that's an immense technical challenge, actually. Exactly. So, yeah, when you think about like private or security of your wallet, um, I mean, I know Alex could probably uh, vouch for this as well, but like in in this industry, when you're when you're working with like different public chats and things like this, it's it's actually somewhat common to see people like in especially like in Bitcoin or some of these older cryptocurrencies, like a lot of people will ask for even customer service or like how do, where do I go to recover my password? And it's like that's not how it works. <laughs> like if you lose your private key, there's a reason why people say to back these things up because if you lose it, there's no bank customer service desk to ask for help um well right it, it's like when people move into like using a two-factor and a password manager it's like the consequences of losing your password are a lot more you know on the one hand it's a lot more secure but you you lose your password once you move to that scenario uh, a lot harder to recover everything because the whole point was it was supposed to be secure i know exactly yeah but, but, yeah uh, I think bottom there are hard problems, and, and I appreciate that you guys are really low at the stack. So I'm curious, so this might be a more relevant question. So um, I assume when you guys launch here, there's there's basically going to be like, you know, an SDK of some kind. Like, is there going to be like a formal process for more application where people who want to build apps on top of your protocol layer? Like, for, for anybody in this chat who's like, oh, I might want to start a startup based on this. Like, what yeah. what is Polkadot going to be providing for people who want to play in the sandbox Polkadot's building? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So we have um, other, there, this, is a, this is just a branding choice. Um, other networks have called it like the name of the network and then SDK. Um, in Polkadot's case, uh, because Polkadot is so complex and it's been taking two, three years to get this launched, um, in the meantime, our kind of sister organization called Parity Technologies, based out of Berlin, they have it's a huge dev shop of about 120 developers. They've been they've built and have been using Substrate, which is our basically our SDK for building block building custom blockchains. So you can think of and Substrate has also been said by um, one of our validators on our network, for example, their CEO said Substrate is Polkadot's biggest um, advantage or, or positive aspect because it's unbelievably powerful for developers. It's basically like a modular framework for building custom blockchains. Um, one way to think about it is like, you know, the music EQ where you can dial up, dial down. That's essentially what you can do for blockchains now. Um, in the comparison to legacy networks, like this is why it's such a leap um, in advancement versus what we're coming from. Because if you're building a, an insurance application, a decentralized finance application, or a game, and you want to launch an Ethereum, you get one choice. You have one blockchain to build on. It doesn't. It's not optimized for anything. With Substrate, you can literally build a blockchain specifically for a use case. So we'll see a gaming blockchain built specifically for the entire gaming um, application group. You'll see an application built specifically for DeFi or decentralized finance that's optimized for probably for security, um, for speed if possible, and so on. So that's that's basically the SDK is Substrate and Substrate.dev is where you can take tutorials, read all the documentation you could dream of. Um, right. And, and if I think I'm, I'm understanding correctly, like really, that's almost what, you know, obviously Polkadot is offering a lot of things and, you know, certainly the ability of different networks to interface and talk with each other certainly will be a game changer, much like when the early little ARPANET networks eventually all got connected together and made the internet. But, but really, you know, and I, I, I'm thinking of this as a software developer, the fact that, you know, you are offering Substrate in this SDK for an SDK for building blockchains that that you know yeah. to me really sounds like the potential game changer because now 
you know, in the past, if I wanted to build my own blockchain network, you know, I'd have to basically learn how to do it all from scratch, reinvent a lot of the wheel again, and, and have to pray that I didn't make some security mistake that like a bunch of other people made and had learned from, but I went and made it again. It's like, you're being like, no, you, 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 the best practices have been figured out, all the basic stuff, here it is. But, you know, now you have the hooks to get all that learned experience, but fine tune your blockchain to do what you need it to do. Exactly. Well, so it, it's been nice to have, too, because while Polkadot's been being built, we've had we've given 100 grants for projects building either applications or tools for the ecosystem. Um, and there's I don't know how many now companies that have formed by building in, on Substrate or building with Substrate in the meantime, who are going to be ready to go once Polkadot's launched. Um, so Does uh, uh, somebody interested apply for one of these grants out of curiosity? Um, it's grants.web3.foundation and there's a, mm. there's a whole process. So there's open grants, which is basically done through GitHub um, and there's detailed instructions there and then there's another one where it's application. I believe it's up to a hundred thousand. Um, so yeah, that's there's a on the GitHub page. There's there's all these kind of instructions and um, mm -hmm. outlines for kind of what they're looking for and stuff like that. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, when and so I mentioned this a little bit in my intro to you, but uh, what is the current timetable as far as Polkadot's launch look like? Is it still quarter two, or have recent events pushed you guys back a little bit? Yeah, it's it's quarter two. Um, we there's just kind of the the running joke in the development world, which is just it's always two weeks from now. So we're uh, yeah, I, know, I know that I know that feeling. Yeah, so <laughs> we're, we're waiting. Um, there's tons of prep work going on right now, and it it is going to be happening very soon. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a phased rollout. So we'll start with like what we're calling a beta. We'll move into um, kind of a network that's not yet fully proof of stake um, called proof of authority, move on to proof of stake, beginning, you know, decentralizing more and more. And then eventually uh, Gavin actually gives up what's called this pseudo. So like he gives up his kind of, um, I don't know, highest level rights to the network. And then um, token transfers are enabled and the network is kind of off into the wild and its own taking on its own life. So. And uh, I guess, you know, uh, one final question I'll ask here, which is uh, for, for people who aren't necessarily interested in building their own applications on top of Polkadot, but kind of want to get in on the ground floor of uh, the ecosystem and seeing what and being able to play with what people will build for the ecosystem. What is the best way to sort of, you know, when it launches, get involved with the ecosystem? Are there particular tools people should download? Like, like what's the way for somebody who doesn't necessarily want to build, but wants to be an early adopter and player in this ecosystem? What, what yeah. paths should they look into? Yep. Um, one, probably the, the best way for a non-technical person to get kind of integrated into the core of the community is we have a Polkadot ambassador program. So we've got about 198 people now across 43 countries. Um, and these are only 40% technical, 60% are non-technical. So these are a lot of people who are interested in helping, for example, set up meetups in different places once we can all have meetups. Um, there's also people who are writing blogs for us, translating uh, materials into their languages. Um, and that's it's a very it's a very um, powerful and tight knit group of people. We have calls every two weeks. People check in on kind of the latest that they're working on, and it's a good way to find out like new projects, ways to get involved. Um, the other one is just probably following us on Twitter and then following our newsletter because you'll see um, through those channels you'll see new projects that are launching. Uh, maybe there's a test net that people want you to start interacting with, uh, which we've seen recently with a couple of the up and coming projects. So probably just following our newsletter and Twitter is another good way to just keep um, abreast of what's going on. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, we're starting to run toward the end of our two hour block here. Does anybody of our uh, stragglers still hanging around? Does anybody have any 
no questions they want to ask Dan? It's fine if the answer is no, <laughs> because I figured I was trying to ask all the questions I thought any of you might have. And, uh, you know, thanks everybody for being patient with us. Um, this has all been a learning process. Um, we will have a video of this talk that I've, I've been recording all this. Um, I'm going to see about having Cat Factory upload it to the normal YouTube channel where these things end up. So, you know, hopefully you'll be able to watch this later. Um, and, you know, obviously you can follow the FF Austin on various social media. You know, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Meetup. Uh, we have our own website and mailing list and stuff. So, yeah, we, we hope you'll uh, keep following along as we all uh, figure out this whole thing together. I'm going to have to put out a more general announcement about this, but we were running into issues with chat early on and basically chat is kind of limited with the setup cat factory's given us i basically have to add guests as formal members of our space and not just a guest if you want to have access to the chat room so we may do that for uh, um, speakers or uh, people who we know and have vetted as members of the community and not just first timers we may explore that as we go forward um, yeah, and I guess finally, uh, Alex, um, I really would like to talk to you more about both your meetup in May as well as just uh, Brave and some of the stuff we talked about in general. Um, I mean, as I said, I, I can repeat my email if you haven't got it yet, if you want to email me to get a hold of me. I got you. It's kevin.welch at effaustin.org, right? Yes, yes. And if you go to effaustin.org, there's a link to our info email, which you can email me at if that doesn't work, um, though I don't always promptly check info, but I should get it at some point. There's also, you can message the meetup group, the Facebook group, you can add the Twitter. Any of these should eventually net a reply from me or another board member at some nebulous point. <laughs> <laughs> Bada bing, well, there we go. Uh, you know, the one thing I wanted to say was, thank you, Dan, for the presentation. This was really awesome. I felt like, you covered everything at like exactly the right pitch that where you're not throwing people into the deep end with like talking about hashes and all this stuff. So that was really great. And Kevin, thank you very much for hosting us. I am so very thankful that you're doing this because as a parent, it is difficult sometimes to like drive downtown. Like I'm in super Southwest Austin, like nearly Hayes County. So it, this is like so much nicer than having to drive into Capital Factory and park. I know. I know the feeling. I'm I'm also Southwest Austin. I'm in Oak Hill, so like there you uh, go. yes, it's a bit of a drive for me. You know, it, I've endlessly debated the advantages and disadvantages of. Well, yes, it's downtown, but of course, also it's very central, and we have a live stream. And so, you know, there's there's no perfect solution. I've in the past just tried to occasionally have meet up and other events that are not downtown, but I really do think this represents a very interesting opportunity to try to broaden our conversations to people who can't always make the downtown meetups and as i said i'm going to try to at least you know do something like have a laptop that will also be showing this and have the space being watched during our meetups because yeah we have the live stream but that's not always a very participatory way to participate in these things so hopefully we're going to figure out uh, good ways to use this going forward so very much appreciated all around. Thank you both very much. Yeah, well, uh, thanks everyone who's participated for the wonderful questions. Um, yeah, and uh, and Dan, let's also just you know uh, keep you have Austin abreast about Polkadot. Um, I think uh, we are natural uh, supporters of your continuing decentralization and privacy transparency efforts with pushing this technology forward. So, any way we can be of help and just continue to partner in the future. Uh, let me know. I know uh, this year uh, South by ended up being a total lost cause, but I'm sure at some point we may be able to think of some interesting uh, sponsorship or event partnerships we could look into in the future. Yeah, we we've deferred our tickets to next year, so we'll everyone will be here. So yeah, I, I mean, well, I'll have to pivot and see what we will or won't do next year based on the state of things, but we'll we'll continue these conversations. Cool. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I think I'm gonna. Call the meetup here if none of you have any additional questions. Thank you all so much. We will be back to this space in about a month's time for um, Daniel's uh, presentation. Um, you know, unless we have some, we we have we have actually use of this room at any time, not just our scheduled meetup times. So if uh, anybody wants to have a meeting or presentation about anything, um, they just need to get at us. Um, we can schedule a one-off. So uh, just let us know.
Thank you all so much for attending. I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to sign off now. Thank you so much, Dan. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.